I have been so excited to get ready to start this series called What Would Jesus Undo? How many of you remember those bracelets that we used to wear when we were in junior high, high school, maybe even elementary school? WWJD, what would Jesus do? I doubt many of you sitting here today know the story behind that bracelet. That bracelet really started as a result of a book that was written by a small church pastor in about 1896. Charles Sheldon wrote a book called In His Steps. That book has gone on to sell over 30 million copies. And Charles Sheldon just very simply woke up one day realizing that his church was in trouble. And not only was his church in in trouble, his own spiritual walk wasn't really where it needed to be. And so he was wrestling with this question, what would Jesus do? And so he very simply began to take that question and apply it to everyday circumstances in life and asking the question, if Jesus were in my shoes, what would Jesus do? We want to take that question and flip it. And we want to flip it for a reason because I believe if Jesus came back today, in our day and time, and he was looking at the church, and he was looking at your life, and he was looking at my life, there would be some things in our life that need to be untied and undone. And so today, I want us to begin by asking the question, what would Jesus undo? Are there things in my personal walk, in my relationship with Jesus Christ, in my walk and in my witness that are not where they ought to be? And this morning's message is based simply upon that question, what would Jesus undo? What's in me that needs to be undone? What's in me that doesn't belong? Let me share a little story with you. How many of you have ever bought something for a special person? And you put a lot of thought into it, and you maybe even spent a lot of money on it, only to discover, you know, that when you gave this gift to this person, they really weren't moved by it. As a matter of fact, they, they may not have even opened the gift. I remember when my grandmother passed away, we were going through her house and, and, and just trying to figure out what we were going to do with a lot of the stuff that she had accumulated over the years. And as we began to go through the drawers, we discovered there were a lot of things that we had bought for her and had given her that she had never even unwrapped. They were still in the original boxes. In her closet were clothes that were bought for her, specifically because she said, oh, I really like that. I would love to have something like that. And her closet was full of dresses and clothes and pantsuits with the tags still on them. And I want you to think about how that probably made my mom feel when she began to look at all the things that she had bought for her mom and they weren't even unwrapped. It was just like, hmm, thanks. And maybe you've had that kind of an experience. You bought something for somebody, you gave it to them, and you were so excited just to be able to give it to them, and only to discover sometimes later they re-gifted it to somebody. Or you saw it on eBay, and uh, you were wondering, man, I I went through all this trouble for you, and you didn't even appreciate it. Now, think about this for just a second. I wonder how Jesus, the Son of God, feels the one who bled and died for us, gave his life for us in order that we might renew and restore our relationship with God. I wonder how he feels when he looks at us and he goes, aren't you excited that your sins have been forgiven? And we go, hmm. Aren't you excited that you've got the Holy Spirit, the living God inside of you? And we go, hmm. We just... Kind of sure. Aren't you glad and excited that you're part of a church that believes in life groups and believes in doing things with each other? Hmm. Aren't you glad that you've got God's word and you can open it at any time, even on your phone and your iPad? Hmm. Aren't you glad that God's gifted you spiritually so that you can serve him and glorify him? Aren't you glad you've got those opportunities? Hmm. I believe that if Jesus came back 
in our day and our time, one of the first things that Jesus would undo is spiritual indifference. And as I look at the church landscape all across our country, we're, we're kind of like, hmm. We've got so many opportunities to glorify him. We've got so many opportunities to grow in our relationship with God. And we've got so many opportunities to share Christ on a regular basis. And you talk to people about it and their response is, hmm, wouldn't you like to be involved in a life group? Hmm. Wouldn't you want to be involved in a Bible study? Hmm. Wouldn't you like an opportunity to serve? Hmm. Whatever. We're kind of the whatever generation. And you, you know something? We're not the first ones to respond to the glories and the riches that we have in Jesus that way. All the way back to the beginning, Jesus wrote a series of letters through the Apostle John to seven churches. And in those letters, he addressed the spiritual indifference of the church. As a matter of fact, if you've got your Bibles with you this morning, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. And as you're turning there, I want you to scan down till you find verse 14. And as you're scanning there, let me just kind of give you the backdrop on this church. You see, the church at Laodicea was a church that was situated in a very powerful town. They weren't huge, but they were influential. As a matter of fact, they were extremely wealthy. They had about anything and everything available to them that a church or a city could want. As a matter of fact, when their church was, their, not the church, but the entire city was destroyed by an earthquake, and the Roman Empire said, we want to send funds and help you rebuild, they said, we don't need it. We got this. As a matter of fact, when Paul founded a church there and he began to write to them, the church started out really well. People were passionately in love with Jesus. They wanted to share their faith. They were glorifying him. They were doing all kinds of incredible things. But 25 years later, it was a very different scene. As the Apostle John wrote the letter that Jesus had spoken to him, to this church, all of those people who were so excited about their relationship with Jesus Christ and were using it to influence an entire community and a region, those people were long dead and gone. And what had happened to the church was very similar to what was going on in the city. You see, I want you to think about a city like Los Angeles. A city maybe even more like Las Vegas, and you kind of have a picture of what Laodicea was like. And they had a problem very similar to what they have in Las Vegas. They had an inadequate water supply. And so they had to have their water piped in, and there were two places that were close enough to them that they could build aqueducts and bring the water in. And one of those was Colossus, which was a city that had extremely cold and refreshing water. And so they would pipe the water in from there by aqueducts. But by the time that it arrived to the city, the water had gone from cold to lukewarm. It was tepid. It was stale. It was stagnant. And the other city that they brought water in from was called Hierapolis. Hierapolis kind of sounds like a place where uh, our action figures would come from, you know, heroes. And they were known for their hot springs. And so the water that started out in Heropolis was extremely warm. But by the time it got to the city, it had cooled off and it also was lukewarm. You see, water that is cold has a purpose. It's refreshing. It's great. It's invigorating. And water that's warm and hot has a purpose as well. But water that's lukewarm... And still, nobody wants to drink it. Nobody wants to bathe in it. And so Jesus is looking at the church and he's looking at their spiritual condition. They see themselves one way, but yet when Jesus begins to examine them, it's an entirely different story. Follow along with me in your Bibles as we begin to read. To the angel 
of the church in Laodicea, write, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Jesus looks at the church and he says, I know your deeds. And here's something we don't really like to talk about. Deeds always reveal where a person's heart is, always. And so Jesus is looking at him and he says, I know your deeds, I know your works, I know where your heart is. I've examined you. And here's what I've found. You're not hot, you're not cold. There's some of us sitting here today who were once on fire for Jesus, passionately in love with him. And now something has happened over time where we're no longer on fire anymore. We're just kind of, hmm. Jesus says, listen, if you were lost as a loon and cold as a brick, I could do something with you. If you were hot and on fire, I could do something with you. But because you're lukewarm and you have grown spiritually indifferent, I can't do anything with you. As a matter of fact, what Jesus says to them, he says, your spiritual indifference doesn't just hurt me. He says, your spiritual indifference makes me sick. As a matter of fact, what he said, in, in many translations, he says, your spiritual indifference to the things of God, to the kingdom of God, to the lost world around you, it literally makes me want to puke. So Jesus is looking at them and he says, I know your deeds. You didn't start out this way, but this is your current condition. And maybe today, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God is saying the same thing to you. He says, I know your deeds. I know your works. As a matter of fact, Jesus in the gospel said, by their fruits, you shall know them. What do your fruits say about you? What does it say about your walk and your witness and your testimony and your love for Jesus and your love for people? And Jesus says you've become spiritually stale. You've become spiritually stagnant. You've become detached from me, your life. And he says, it makes sense me sick. You know, as I was reading through this passage and thinking about this message today, I realized that if we really are honest with ourselves, there's probably two sources, two main causes of spiritual indifference in our lives. And, and, and not everybody is always on fire for Jesus. Not everybody is always cold to Jesus and cold to the things of God, a lot of times we're just there in that medium state of hmm, spiritual indifference. So what's the source? What's the root cause of that? Jesus looks at the church and he says it's the illusion, number one, it's the illusion of self-sufficiency. If you've ever taken any time to talk to people as you're going through the grocery store or you're sitting on a plane or you're at a rest stop or wherever, or you're at college and you're talking to them about their need for God and their relationship with God, one of the things that you're often going to hear from people is, I'm good. Why do I need Jesus? I got everything I need. I got my stuff. I got my toys. I got my things. I got my iPhone. I got my iPad. I got my big screen TV. I got my clothes. I got this. I got that. I'm good. As a matter of fact, if 
Jesus had audibly spoken these words, our response would probably be pretty much the same. If Jesus looks at us and he says, you're drifting, you're stale, you're stagnant, we would probably have responded the same way the church did. They said, we're rich. We've acquired wealth. We don't need a thing. Jesus said, you're rich in the things of this world. You're rich in your stuff, but what you don't realize is that your stuff has no substance. You think stuff can make you happy? You think stuff can pave the way to peace? It cannot. And so Jesus says to them, he says, you're fooling yourself and you're kidding yourself. You think that all of the things that we have, all the activities that we do can bring you life? They can't. So Jesus says to them, you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, Poor, blind, and naked. I wonder how many of us could say that our lives are full of stuff. And stuff isn't just material things. Stuff is oftentimes the activities that we cram on our calendars. But how many of us on the flip side of that would say our lives seem to lack direction and meaning and purpose? It's one of the reasons that we become spiritually indifferent to the voice of God, to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, is our illusion of self-sufficiency. Here's the second one. The distractions of this world. And, And this, I think, is the number one cause. People quit growing in their relationship in Christ. This is the number one reason people get comfortable, people get complacent, is they get distracted. It's like this, we've got things to do, we've got jobs, we've got activities, we've got to get the kids here, get the kids there, and we become so distracted that we were on target, we were on course with God, and then we just got pulled off because life happens, doesn't it? We got doctor's appointments, we got this crisis and that crisis, and we're running, running, running from activity to activity to activity. And we're distracted. It's not that we planned it that way. It's just life happens, doesn't it? And before you know it, you find yourself in a place that you never thought you would be. And so Jesus says to them, I think what he would have said to any of us, Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, he's telling a story, he's telling a parable, and it's about a sower who went out to sow. And as he's going along, he's sowing his seed, and some of it falls on the path, some of it falls among the rocks, some of it falls among the weeds, and I think this is the adequate description of many so-called believers. And Jesus says, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things, came in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. If I were to ask you, where, where, where have you been in your walk with Jesus? Where have you been in your service to God? And some of you would say, you know, I, I used to do this, I used to do that, I was involved in this, and I was serving here, giving here, growing here. Well, what are you doing now? Hmm. Is it because there's no opportunities? Huh. Is it because they won't let you? Hmm. What happens is we get so distracted by the worries of living day in and day out that the tyranny of the urgent The tyranny of what's happening now takes precedence and priority over what's eternally important and significant. So how do you know? How do you know 
if you become lukewarm, if you become indifferent. Over the years, I've discovered there's about six different warning signs that maybe you're heading on a path to spiritual indifference. Let me give you a couple of these this morning. I'll give them to you fairly quickly this morning. Number one, we're more concerned about impressing people than we are God. Just go online. Just turn on the TV. We are the selfie generation today. And everywhere we want people to see what we're doing, what our kids are doing, or our grandkids are doing. And we look to see how many likes we got. Like me, like me, like me, love me, love me, love me. Do you like what I'm wearing? Do you like what I'm doing? Isn't it exciting? Don't you want to be me? Like, 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 like. And we're, we're so concerned about who's checking into our page or into our Instagram account or into our, our Facebook account. And yet we're not checking in with God. What do you think, God? Do you like what I'm doing? Here's the second one. We're obsessed with life on earth rather than eternity. We're more obsessed with making a living and making a life here and now than we are for eternity. We're more obsessed with what we can accumulate here than what we can send on ahead. We get so focused on the here and now that eternity, where we're going to spend the majority of our time, we don't even think about it. We don't even think about it. It doesn't even cross our mind. We're just worried about today. We're worried about tomorrow. We're worried about when we can retire. And we're not worried about where we're going to be spending eternity. Listen, what you do here and the time you spend here is going to be a drop of sand in the ocean compared to what you're going to be doing in eternity. But yet we're so earthly-minded so earthly minded that eternity doesn't matter. Here's, here's a third one. And, and this is one that deeply troubles me. We rationalize sin without truly fearing God. We rationalize sin without truly fearing God. As a matter of fact, we're, we've gotten so good at it that we've given it new names. We don't call it what it is anymore. We, oh, uh, they had an affair, he had an affair. We don't call it adultery. Well, I'm just looking at adult entertainment. We don't call it pornography. I got a porn issue. I have a disease. We don't call it alcohol. Drugs. We rationalize our sin and we don't fear a holy God who looks at it and says, this is not the way you're supposed to be living. When we get to that point where we are more concerned about what other people think than what God thinks about what we're doing, we're in a scary place. Why? Because when we become desensitized to the seriousness of sin, where it no longer bothers our conscience and our nation, we are not just lukewarm, we are numb. Here's a fourth one. We believe in Jesus, but we rarely share our faith. We believe in Jesus, but we rarely share our faith. Why is that? You know, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're a believer, you've got the greatest news in the world. It's called the gospel. It's called good news. And yet, when I talk to average believers, just the ones who come to church regularly, 
And I rarely ever hear a conversation where they're talking to somebody about their spiritual state, about where they are going to be spending eternity, about their relationship with Jesus. And I wonder, why is that? Why is it that we can talk about anything and everything, but we don't talk to people about the things that are the most important about where you are with Jesus? Do you know him? I think, honestly, it's because we had no longer really believe that God's going to judge our sin and that people are going to spend eternity in a place called hell without him. So we don't share. Why? It's, it's just good. I'm good. I don't know about you, but I'm good. So we don't share. There's no compassion. There's no conviction. There's no urgency in our life. We, we've got just enough of Jesus that we feel good about ourselves and maybe where we think we're going that we don't bother to share with anybody else. Here's a fifth one. You want to know if you become spiritually indifferent? You only turn to God when you need him. He's just a tool in your toolbox when there's an emergency, when you are in a jam or you're in a crisis, but yet he's not a part of your day in and day out life. Oh, oh, uh, this, I got this prognosis. I got to pray. I got to pray. Oh, Jesus, come help me, help me, help me. And then we put him back in the toolbox. I need a job. Oh, God, oh, God. When we get a job, we put him back in the toolbox but we don't have a relationship with him. We are spiritually indifferent when we use God, when we use Jesus, when we're in a crisis or in a panic, but yet he's not a part of our day in, day out life. He isn't on our hearts and on our minds. We don't dwell on him. We don't dwell on his word. We just use him when we need him. Some of you older folks in here, there may be more than one or two. You're Brill Cream Christians. A lot of you younger ones have no idea. What is Brill Cream? All right, men in the house, what is Brill Cream? What was their slogan? Just a dab will do you. Just a dab will do you. You see, that's all people want with Jesus. Just to dab will do me when I need him. Just to dab will do you. I'm sorry. I don't think Jesus ever intended for just a dab to do us. I think he intended to be our life. The Apostle Paul Speaking in Athens, he's looking at all the idols, all the stuff, all the false God. And then he's beginning to try to help them make the transition to the one true and living God. And he says, I see you guys are very religious. And I saw this, I, this altar to an unknown God. Let me tell you about who he really is. And then he said something there in the book of Acts that's staggering. He said, in him, talking about God, in him we live and move and have our being. Are you a Brill Cream Christian? Are you one who lives and moves and has your being in him? There's a big difference. Here's the sixth one. We're not that much different than the rest of the world. You go, I'm a Christian. Really? What's that? I go to church. I walked the aisle sometime when I was a kid or a young person. I made a profession. I got baptized. I'm a Christian. Really? Really? Jesus looks at us and he says, I know your deeds. How different is your life from somebody who isn't a Christian? Is it any different? 
You see, I think that's one of the major problems that we have in the church today. We have become so spiritually indifferent. We've become so spiritually anesthetized that we are numb. We veg out in front of the TVs. We watch the same programs that the rest of the world watches. We buy the same products. We go to the same places. And we wonder why our witness isn't any more effective. Why people look at the church and they look at you and they look at me and they're going, why do I need Jesus? You're no different than me. We have become just like the rest of the world. And the sad thing is, most of us, we didn't start out there. You know, I, th- I think that's the thing that is heartbreaking. If you never knew anything any different, if that was the only Christian life you had ever saw and ever witnessed, you- you'd just be, well, that's just the way things are. But many of you have been around others who were passionate about their relationship with Jesus, their walk with God. And so you'd know, and, and you know what? There's enough of them around that we only have to look at them and look at ourselves in the mirror and we're going, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not as radical as they are. Isn't that a word we like to use for people who are on fire for Jesus? They're walking with the Lord. They're radical. They're extreme. Really? Could it be they're just in love with Jesus and you're not? Could it be they're just passionate about Jesus, but you're not? And like a marriage that has grown cold and stale, and you're just going through the motions. You live together. You eat together. You sit down and watch TV together. But there's no fire. There's no passion in your relationship. You see, we do it every day. We treat others with indifference, and then we treat the God of heaven, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with spiritual indifference, and we think that there's nothing wrong with it. And I'll be the first to confess how easy it is to get distracted. I want to tell you, the last two weeks have been really hard for me preparing to preach. Let me tell you why. Uh, my wife will tell you her husband is a little OCD. Yeah. Uh, I even got an amen out of that. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> Obsessive compulsive. If it's broken, I've got to fix it. If it's lost, I've got to find it. Beginning of September, I was fishing with my son, And when we got back to the truck, we're putting all our stuff away. I didn't think about it because I had taken an extra reel with me. I love to fly fish. And uh, an extra rod because I was going to switch from dry fly fishing to nymph fishing. And so when we got back to the house, I just put my stuff away. I didn't think any more about it until about a week and a half ago. And I I was thinking, you know, maybe I'll go fishing this week if I've got time. And so I got my stuff out, and I'm looking through it. I can't find my reel. Not just any reel, but a reel that somebody had given me as a gift. It was extremely important to me. And so I began to think. I, I went all through my closet, not just once, but probably five times, through the garage, everything. I called my son, will you look in your truck? And, and Andrew knows when dad's lost something, it's on. And, and it just, just constantly was there, ba- nagging me, distracting me. And, and I was thinking, well, what am I going to do? Well, I posted it on Facebook. I, you know, I was fishing this creek, and maybe somebody's found it. Maybe it'll come back. No such luck. So then it was, how can I buy another? So that that was on my mind for the last nine days, driving me nuts. I got opportunities to share Jesus with people. 
I got opportunities to spend time in his word. I got opportunities to be part of a life group and do life with other people. I've got opportunities to worship with others. And, you, you know, don't you want to do all that? No, I got to find my real. No, I got to buy a new one. You've got opportunities all the time to deepen your walk and your relationship with Jesus. And if you're not careful, you'll be distracted, you'll be pulled away, and before you know it, you will be lukewarm. So how do you, how do you reignite spiritual fire? Let me give you just a few things. I, I want to bring us home quickly. How, how can you reignite the spiritual fire? I could tell you to do a lot of things. I could tell you, you need to spend time in his word. You need to be in prayer. You need to get involved in a life group. You need to be at church. You need to find a place to serve. And I could give you this big, long list of things to do. And you would walk out of here, and you know what you would do? Probably none of them. You'd think about it, you would intend to, but it would be so overwhelming to you, you're going, that's not where I am, that's not what I'm used to doing. I can't do all this. And I've discovered something. I've discovered something that has more power to change your spiritual condition and change your walk with Jesus than anything else that I could tell you, and I'm glad it's early in the year because I think it's huge and it's important and it's foundational for everything else we're gonna do over the next seven weeks. Here's what it is, this one thing. Do one thing every day that requires faith. Do something every day that requires faith. If you just begin to do that, think about how it would radically change your life. And you see, the reality is, is that most of us are creatures of habit. We're so into our routines. We're predictable. We have a pattern that we follow. We do this, we do that. Do something different. Begin to talk to God. Begin to listen to God and say, God, what is the one thing you want me to do today that is going to require faith? And then do that. For some of you, it might be picking up the phone and calling a person that you need to forgive. For others of you, it may be picking up the phone and calling somebody that you need to be forgiven by. For others, it may be volunteering and serving and doing something and plugging in and being passionate. For others, it may be attempting to do something that you will utterly fail at if God doesn't come through. Maybe God's laid something on your heart and your mind that you're supposed to be doing. You're going, I can't do that. Just take one step in God's direction. Do one thing today that requires faith. Why? Because for this very simple reason, you cannot please God apart from faith. Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible, what? to please God. And not only that, but Paul writing to Timothy, James writing to the church, he said, faith without works is what? Dead. Faith is life. Faith is life, and that's what God is looking for in you and me, is somebody who's passionately alive for Jesus. Somebody that I don't have to take their pulse to see if they are alive for Jesus. Do one thing today that requires faith. And you know what will happen? If you begin to do that consistently over time, you will find out your life will be changed. You see, here's the major problem most of us have. We have a little bit of Jesus we have just enough of Jesus to desensitize us to our own sin issues. We have just enough of Jesus to make us comfortable and complacent, but not on fire for him. We don't have enough of Jesus to change us or transform us. But if we would begin to just do one thing every day, one thing, one thing, one thing that requires faith, you know what will happen? You will be transformed over time.
That's a hard way to do it, but folks, I'm going to tell you, that's the one way to do it that really matters. And you're going, that's hard. Well, folks, I'm going to tell you something. It's better to exist. It is better to exist and hurt with a purpose than it is to live without one. And if you can make Jesus the purpose of your life, if you can begin to do one thing every day that requires faith from you, you not only will change, you'll begin to impact the people around you. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're going, this message hurts. I'll say, I'm glad. See, because the reality is I believe we have more in common with Laodicea than we want to admit. You talk to people, where are you at with Jesus? I'm good. You go to church? No. You involved in a life group? No. Are you serving anywhere? No. Are you giving? Are you growing? Hmm. But I'm good. Why? How do you know? Well, I walked an aisle. I got baptized. Are you any different? Are you changed? And maybe you're sitting here today and you realize that maybe once upon a time, I was on fire for Jesus. But now something's happened. I've become spiritually indifferent, and I don't like where I'm sitting today. If that is you, if you realize any one of those six signs describe you, then you've got something you need to do. As a matter of fact, Jesus looks at the church and he says, listen, I love you, and because I love you, you can't stay where you're at. You cannot stay spiritually stagnant. You cannot stay spiritually stale. You must do something. What did he say? He looks at the church. He says, I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your what? Let's say it again. Indifference. He says, I correct and I discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Maybe you're here today and you realize I've never really loved Jesus. I never really made a decision that required me to change. All I did was make a decision that made me comfortable. It didn't do anything. And if you're here today and that's describing you, today you need to come into a real relationship with Jesus. You need to repent of your sins and turn to Jesus in faith and ask him to forgive you and make a determination from this point forward, I will follow Jesus. I will never be the same. If that's you today, when I give the invitation, you need to stand up where you are and move here. For others of you, maybe, maybe you, you, you were all those things. You were truly changed, but you have grown cold. You've become lukewarm. You're no longer passionately in love with Jesus. You're just casual friends. If that's you, Jesus says, it makes me sick. He said, you say, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth and don't need a thing. You're sitting here and you're thinking, I'm good. I sing in the choir. I'm good. I teach Sunday school. I'm good. I come to church. I'm good. I go to youth group. I'm good. But are you passionately in love with Jesus? Are you passionately serving Him? Are you growing with Him? If not, something's wrong. Have you ever noticed how in a relationship the other person knows something's wrong way before you're willing to admit it? Everybody's sitting here and you're going, yeah, if you're married, you know what I'm saying. 
You see, the other person knows long before you're willing to admit it, you've got a problem. You've grown cold. You've grown indifferent. Today, don't ignore him. Don't ignore him. Today, do not ignore him. Listen to how Jesus closes his message to this church. Listen to what he says to you, to me. He says, behold, I'm standing at the door of your heart. I'm knocking. I'm knocking. If you hear me and open the door, I'll come in. He's knocking. Will you open the door? Or will you just go, hmm, I'm good. Let's pray. Maybe I've been talking to you. Maybe God's been talking to you this morning. And you realize, I'm at a place I don't want to be. I never thought I would be, but I have grown lukewarm. I've become indifferent. I've become what I never thought. If that's you today, don't, don't put off. Don't put off renewing and your relationship and coming back to Jesus. Maybe that's the invitation you need to hear. doesn't matter how long you've been walking away from Jesus. The minute you turn around and come back to Jesus, He will receive you with open arms. For those of you here today and you've never established a relationship with Jesus, today's the day that you need to say, Lord Jesus, I believe You died for my sins. You went to the cross for me. You love me that much, and today, Jesus, I want to change. I want to be different. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life, and I'll follow you to the best of my ability from this day forward until you come back to get us or I go to be with you. I'm yours and you are mine. If that's your prayer today, as soon as the music begins to play, you stand up where you are, you come and see me. If there's a decision you need to make this morning in a different way, we will be waiting here to receive you.